All right, so chapter 12 is on the fluids and minerals required for oral soft tissue and salivary glands. So water is the most abundant component in the body, as I'm sure you are aware. It constitutes 75 to 80% of the body weight at birth, but in an adult, it's about 50 to 60% of our body weight. Body fluids are distributed into compartments. So here we need to understand intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid, and that water doesn't have to uh, have any kind of um, um, issues tra traveling through and between, um, and it does so through osmotic pressure, which will equalize the solute concentration of both the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. So I have the image kind of in the background, but you can see that there's fluid both on the inside of the blood vessel and the outside. If there's more on the outside than there is on the inside, then according to osmosis, the uh, fluid on the outside will pass through into the inside in order to balance that out. And the same happens if there's more fluid on the inside than there is on the outside. As far as the physiologic roles of water, it does act as a solvent enabling chemical reactions to occur by entering into some reactions like hydrolysis, which we've been talking about a lot. It maintains stability of all body fluids as the principal component and medium for fluids via blood and lymph fluid, secretions like saliva and gastrointestinal fluids, and excretions like urine and perspiration. It enables transport of nutrients to cells and provides medium for excretion of waste products through the blood and lymph. It acts as a lubricant between cells to permit movement without friction. This is important for us. It's also going to regulate our body temperature through both perspiration uh, as it evaporates from our skin and vapor from our nose and mouth. And as we all know, a few days without water can be fatal for humans. All right, so the adequate intake for fluids, this is something that you are going to want to know, that for men, it is going to be 3.7 liters or 15 to 16 cups per day. And for women, it's going to be 2.7 liters or 11 to 12 cups per day. Now, when you read the recommendations like from um, larger websites, they're saying eight glasses a day, which is close to 16 cups. So uh, don't get confused in the difference between cups and glasses, depending on your source. Water is lost via a variety of routes. We do give off a lot of, uh, a lot of liquids. And so one of them is urination, perspiration, expiration, and defecation. So um, those are the four methods. Uh, when as little as 2% of body water is lost, osmoreceptors are stimulated, which will create physiological desire to ingest liquids. This, in healthy adults, is going to be considered thirst, right? <laughs> thirst is the earliest sign of the body's need for fluids, but a lot of times people will mistake thirst for hunger. Osmoreceptors are neurons in the hypothalamus, I'm sorry, in the hypothalamus, sensitive to changes in serum osmolality levels. So a decreased blood pressure will also stimulate the release of the enzyme renin, which ultimately leads to the increased release of the hormone aldosterone by the adrenal cortex. This is what's going to tell us we're thirsty. This is going to, to uh, encourage us to drink water, and then we're going to replace that water lost. No digestion is necessary for our water absorption. It is easily able to pass through um, the cellular membranes. It is transported easily in both directions across the intestinal mucosa by osmosis. Within an hour, one liter can be absorbed from the small intestine. So normally, almost all fluid is absorbed with only a very small amount that continues through. Okay, so we're going to get into the different sources of fluids or liquids that you can drink. Um, obviously, first is water, and it is the only liquid nutrient that is essential for body hydration. You don't need any other type of liquid in order to hydrate your body. 
plain tap water is the most natural source of fluids. It is the best way to get water. Uh, you know, it contains both the mineral content that comes naturally in a lot of places. It has fluoride. Uh, it comes at usually around the right pH level. It's pretty much the, the best way to get water. However, many Americans have, according to your book, become disenchanted with tap water. I've never personally thought that I was disenchanted with the water, but I, I know I don't love tap water. I do use a filter. Um, when groundwater becomes polluted, it is no longer safe. So we do have the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, which will regulate the level of contaminants allowed in drinking water in public water systems. Um, 30 to 34 percent of our fluid intake is going to come from water and we are beginning to use more bottled water um, especially here in the United States um, and bottled water is not better for us than tap water um, bottled water may taste better but oftentimes it does not contain fluoride which um, it just depends on where they got the water they put into the bottle um, and then also it can be uh, a slightly acidic pH. So you wanna be careful whenever you are using bottled water. Plus there's plastic. Um, moving on to coffees and teas. Uh, coffee is actually the number one beverage consumed at home uh, along with tea. The US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, continues to investigate the amount of caffeine that is safe. This is an ongoing um, issue. Caffeine is considered a drug. It is a stimulant and uh, they are continuing to try to figure out how much caffeine is, uh, is too much. So the FDA has also issued warnings regarding teas that contain senna, aloe, buckthorn, and other plant-derived laxatives. All right, so next is soft drinks. Um, and so sugar-sweetened beverages constitute 47% of added sugar intake in the American diet. So if uh, when people can cut out, you know, sugar sweetened beverages, they typically will have a, a much easier time um, losing weight if it's something that they are already doing. If it's not something that's already in their diet, then cutting it out uh, probably probably won't help. Approximately half of the increase in energy intake occurring over the past 20 years is attributed to sweetened beverages. Uh, I mean, we like soda. Um, I grew up in Michigan, so in Michigan uh, we say pop, but I have broken that habit. Um, energy drinks, um, I'm a big fan. Um, so sales have actually d more than doubled in the past five years. Energy drinks have really, uh, the market has taken off. They are marketed as an ergogenic uh, to delay fatigue. Basically, they are a stimulant that wakes you up. Uh, they typically will contain caffeine, uh, guarana and taurine, which are all considered to be stimulants. Um, now, energy drinks, they do have sugar-free versions, but typically they are, when you're reading about energy drinks, you are reading about the sugar-sweetened versions of them, and they will normally contain 140 calories per eight ounce servings just from sugar uh, and that carbohydrate. So next is sports drinks. Um, sports drinks are designed for highly trained endurance athletes who exercise at high intensity for long periods of time. So this is not for someone you know who uh, goes to the gym for an hour every day. This is for someone who is um, you know running anywhere you know like a uh, hundred miles a week or someone who is um, you know, training for hours at a time, in, in, like per day for multiple days um, in a week. So it, they're, really, they're really not meant for people um, who just work out occasionally or work out even regularly. They're meant for those like um, high intensity endurance athletes. Um, and those are the kinds of 
uh, Powerade and Gatorade sort of thing. Um, you have to be careful with those drinks as well because they are sugar sweetened beverage. And so uh, sometimes you'll get them and they'll be pretty high in sugar um, and they're also pretty high in sodium. Um, erosion, so most sports and energy drinks will have a pH in the acidic range, anywhere from three to four. Calcium added to, um, sorry, calcium has been recently added to a lot of sports drinks in order to lessen the erosive potential to teeth, uh, but this is not, um, I mean, it's not completely negating those effects. So research has suggested that enamel erosion with various beverages occurs in the following order. So this is from least to greatest, I'm sorry, from greatest to least. This one is going to be energy drinks, sports drinks, regular soda, and diet soda. So um, as far as the enamel erosion goes, energy drinks are causing the most erosion, and then they're followed up by sports drinks, then regular soda, and then diet soda is last, but diet soda is still causing erosion because it is pulling that acidic range down. Okay, so we have uh, hyper and hypo states of fluid intake. So for hyper, this is going to have a fluid volume excess or FVE. And what this means is they're taking in more liquid than they are excreting through the various methods of excretion, right? Um, it occurs in the extracellular fluid compartments secondary to an increase in total body sodium. So sodium, the more sodium you have in your system, the more water you will kind of hold on to, right? We kind of usually understand this through like the idea of bloating. Um, it results in a rapid weight gain, which is considered water weight, and then puffy eyelids, distended neck veins, and elevated blood pressure because that sodium is kind of pulling that water in and holding it in the blood vessels, um, and it's causing a lot of pressure um, I'm sorry, it's not holding the water in there. It's, the water is extracellular, but because so, it's putting pressure on the blood vessel. So those people who are at risk are going to be congestive heart failure people, chronic renal failure, chronic liver disease, and those high levels of steroids. the hypo states of fluid intake. Now this is when there is a fluid volume deficit, and this means that they are giving off more liquid than they are consuming, right? Um, this is associated with excessive loss of fluids from the gastrointestinal tract, like vomiting, diarrhea, or drainage tubes. Um, the urinary tract, so diuretics, polyuria, or excessive urination, um, and the skin through sweating, right? Through a lot of exercise, you can become dehydrated. The classic signs are going to be that dry tongue, um, and this is this is through long-term um, dehydration. So the tongue that you see here, how it has the vertical lines or slits or wrinkles or however you want to call that, um, that extend lengthwise on the tongue, those are signs of dry tongue through dehydration. Now, if you see a lot of those lines going more in a horizontal pattern, that is more the way that the tongue was formed or maybe trauma or something something other typically than uh, dehydration. Um, obviously, xerostomia. If they have super dry tongue, they probably don't have a lot of saliva. There's going to be a shrinkage of oral mucous membranes. We see this a lot in older adults, but we'll see more recession because their tissue typically will tend to recede a bit. There is a decreased skin turgor, um, which is like the amount of uh, sort of thickness to their tissue, um, you'll find that their cheek tissue kind of gets sucked up into the suction uh, way easier. And then dry skin uh, and decreased urinary output. And um, the fluid volume deficit is mild. Oral fluids are probably good enough. But if it's continuous, if it's long term and it's severe, then a lot of times they have to be given an IV in order to um, pull them out of it.
Okay, so as far as electrolytes go, we're going to go into some of the, the more popular ones or the, the more prevalent ones, sorry. Uh, they are compounds or ions that dissociate in solution, right? So they, they don't necessarily stay near one another. Uh, they have cations, which have a positive charge, and these include sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And the principal cation in plasma and interstitial fluid is going to be sodium. And then anion, which has a negative charge, this is going to be your chloride, your bicarbonate, and phosphate. The principal anion in plasma is going, and I'm sorry, plasma and interstitial fluid is chloride. Electrolytes are important in water balance and acid base or pH balance. So uh, if we want our bodies to stay balanced, because if we get too acidic or we get too basic, then we actually will die. So uh, it's we have a lot of mechanisms in our system and we use electrolytes in order to stay in that proper pH balance. First up is sodium. The physiologic role of sodium is to maintain normal extracellular fluid concentration by affecting the concentration, excretion, and absorption of potassium and chloride and water distribution. So sodium plays a huge role in our body's ability to stay hydrated and to regulate the fluid intake and output. But also you guys will learn in pharmacology, sodium plays a big role in how how our nerves work. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's there at the bottom. Facilitate impulse transmission in nerve and muscle fibers. So we have sodium and potassium channels that will uh, either fire or not fire our nerves. And then regulate the acid base balance, right? So we have, we just saw all of those electrolytes. Sodium is in the positive category, so it does help to regulate our pH. Um, one interesting thing about sodium is that the amount of sodium that you have in your saliva is going to determine whether or not you can taste the sodium in your food. So if you have very low sodium, you, you eat a very low sodium diet, and then you eat something really salty, you're going to think it tastes really salty versus someone who eats a lot of sodium often, um, they'll taste it and think it won't. And that's why that works that way. It's based on the amount of sodium that is already in your saliva. Um, so there is no recommendation um, as far as a dietary allowance. Uh, there is no like you must eat this much. Um, they do have a minimum that you should eat more than, which is 500 milligrams. Uh, they have the average, which uh, is 1500 milligrams per day. Um, with the upper limit that they think that you should eat being at 2,300 milligrams per day. However, here in the United States, the daily consumption of salt is about 3,400 milligrams per day, which is probably why approximately one third of Americans have hypertension. You guys are seeing patients in clinic, so you know hypertension is kind of a big thing. Um, I talk to my, typically whenever, you know, you get someone who uh, has high blood pressure, you know, tell them to, to lay off of the salt for a couple of days before they come back for their next appointment. Um, so scientific studies have irrefutably agreed that reducing salt intake will reduce blood pressure in individuals with hypertension. Okay, and so as far as sources of sodium goes, the number one source is going to be in meat, um, with especially poultry. Um, it's going to be in salt water fish, which uh, seems fair if they came out of the, the salty ocean, um, and then eggs, dairy products, and even some vegetables. Now, approximately 10% of the sodium that is consumed comes from a natural content of food. So there's there is sodium like in soil um, that gets absorbed as like you know plants are growing things like that. That is expected. Um, approximately 75 to 80 percent of the sodium that is consumed is added to processed foods and foods prepared in restaurants and fast food establishments. So the vast vast majority of sodium that is consumed is made 
anywhere except your house. <laughs> so if you're buying prepackaged foods and eating those, those are going to be very high in sodium. And anytime you eat out at a restaurant and they do that because they want the food to be very palatable to get you to come back and eat it again. Right. Uh, but they also do it in order to increase the shelf life and make sure that the food stays good. Um, but they're giving us way too much. Okay, so we have two states here of hyper and hypo. Hyper sodium, which is called hypernatremia, that's going to be elevated serum sodium levels. Here, the symptoms and the signs are going to be an extreme thirst, a dry or sticky tongue, and oral mucous membranes. Um, we'll see fevers and convulsions in very severe cases. As far as a hypo state, there is hyponatremia, which is low serum sodium levels, and that water intoxication or hyponatremia can occur when individuals drink too much water. Um, and then early symptoms of hyponatremia are nausea and abdominal cramps, headache, confusion, lethargy, and coma. I've seen instances where people who like run marathons, um, they drink so much water and they don't um, always get like the Gatorade stations and before they started putting Gatorade stations um, throughout the, the races, uh, people would bring a little packet of salt with them and then whenever they'd get their cup, they'd like shoot a little packet of salt that, that went with it because uh, they didn't want to become hyponatremic. Um, as far as hyponatremia, that can develop when the sodium losses exceed water losses as well. So if you're, you know, taking certain medications or things like that, then you can lose more sodium than you lose water, and that will put you in that state. Uh, but usually, uh, that one is not as detrimental um, and as uncomfortable as the hyponatremia. Next is chloride. So the physiologic role is going to be to maintain the extracellular balance, the osmotic equilibrium, and electrolyte balance. Same thing as sodium, right? Except that chloride is negative. The requirements and regulations, the average intake is going to be 2,300 milligrams a day for adults. The large concentrations of chloride are going to be present in gastric secretions, which are important for protein digestion and creating an acidic environment to inhibit bacterial growth and enhance iron, calcium, and vitamin B12 absorption. Conditions associated with sodium depletion, such as persistent heavy sweating, chronic diarrhea, vomiting, or chronic renal failure can precipitate hypochloremia and an electrolyte imbalance. So um, the sources where we get um, chloride is also in salt, table salt. So we have sodium chloride, they come together. And um, when we have too much chloride or too little, uh, if we have too much toxicity is gonna be caused by the excessive intakes of salt, um, dehydration, renal failure. And then we can also run into something called Cushing's syndrome, which I'm sure you guys are learning about in your um, special needs course. Next is potassium. Uh, the physiologic role of potassium is going, of course, to maintain cellular concentration. But this one is the intracellular concentration. Um, it directly affects muscle contraction, especially cardiac muscle, and electrical conductivity of the heart. So again, next term, you guys are going to hear a lot about how sodium and potassium work together to get your nerves firing the way that they are supposed to. Uh, the transmission of nerve impulses um, and potassium also helps to regulate acid-base balance. Uh, potassium fell into the positive half. The requirements or the average intake for adults is going to be 4,700 milligrams per day. Uh, we talked about it before, but bananas aren't the best source of potassium. They are a source, but not the best. Uh, leafy green veggies are probably your best source. Um, there is no tolerable upper intake level and approximately 92% of that ingested potassium is going to be then excreted through urine. 
Um, here are the list of sources. So the first is dairy and then meat, grains, fruits, vegetables, processed foods, and then of course potassium supplements and salt subs uh, substitutes. So my, uh, my grandma used to, well she probably still is, she takes a medication called hydrochlorothiazide or it's sometimes um, reduced down to HCTZ. It is a diuretic, it's something that uh, diabetics take, or not diabetics, it's actually prescribed for uh, high blood pressure but it's a diuretic and when they force someone to take a diuretic it also makes them excrete a lot of potassium so they end up having to take a potassium pill and she would always complain that the potassium pill was huge like it was just it was way too large of a horse pill for her to take um, as far as the sources of potassium goes, dairy, meat, and grains are going to contribute 31% of that total dietary potassium in the, uh, in the American diet. Potassium, um, when we talk about hyper or hypo, we're going to call it kalemia. So hyperkalemia is going to be an elevated serum potassium, and it's actually life-threatening. So it can uh, cause cardiac arrest if you have too much potassium um, and you don't have that balanced out with sodium um, the causes can be from impaired renal excretion, so for whatever reason your kidneys aren't getting rid of the potassium. There can be an increased shift of potassium out of cells, so uh, perhaps you know there's too much uh, sodium. And then an increased potassium intake, you know maybe you're taking the potassium pill but you uh, aren't excreting it properly. And then treatment for this is going to involve potassium restriction or using medications to remove potassium. Hypokalemia is going to be much more common, and this one is when you don't have enough potassium. This cause is typically from drugs like diuretics, um, furosemide and hydrochlorothiazide. Those are, uh, well, hydrochlorothiazide is the probably number one uh, diuretic that is prescribed for high blood pressure, and um, it will, any diuretic will, but this one especially will deplete potassium stores. Uh, Cushing syndrome, you'll learn about in your other course. Hyperaldosteronism, hypomanganesemia, and alcoholism. Uh, all of these conditions, uh, which are pretty rare, um, Cushing syndrome and diuretics are the, the number one causes. Alcoholism is going to be um, not necessarily having anything to do with your absorption of potassium, but because um, you, well, alcohol is a slight diuretic um, and it will uh, dehydrate you because um, it, it, you know, it forces you to um, urinate more often. And then potassium is the major ICF cation and it uh, deficits can affect every single body system. Um, I mean, it's going to affect your pH balance for sure. The physiologic roles of iron. So iron plays a component of hemoglobin that's your blood, uh, catalyzes many oxidative reactions within cells. Uh, the conversion of beta carotene to vitamin A, uh, right, which we know beta carotene is the plant source of vitamin A. Uh, the formation of purines as part of nucleic acid. The removal of lipids from the blood. It's going to help to detoxify uh, drugs in the liver. It helps in the synthesis of collagen and the production of antibodies. Um, also, lactoferrin is capable of binding iron. The recommended dietary allowance for men and postmenopausal women is going to be eight milligrams per day. Women who are premenopausal, typically this is anywhere from 19 to 50, they recommend um, 18 milligrams per day. And the reason for that is the amount of iron that is lost through menstruation. Um, the upper or the tolerable upper intake level is going to be 45 milligrams per day. You don't want to get more than that. Um, 
The RDA is higher, obviously I said for menstruation, but when a cell dies, iron is recycled, um, being released and transported to various storage sites to be used again. So we don't, that's why there's an upper tolerable intake level because we don't just get rid of it um, as soon as the cell dies. So iron is not absorbed very well. It's very poorly absorbed. Um, and it binds to the serum, I'm sorry, serum protein transferrin. Iron is continuously transported through the body because transferrin functions to recycle iron. So transferrin is kind of traveling all around to, uh, to pick up all the iron bits. Absorption of heme iron parallels the body's needs. So however much iron your body needs, if you have heme iron in your diet, you will absorb all of it that you need. Um, as far as the absorption of non-heme iron, that's going to depend on intraluminal and meal composition and physiologic needs. So it's just gonna be a little bit more complicated. We're gonna talk about the difference between heme iron and non-heme. Okay, so heme iron is going to come from organ meats, meat, fish, and poultry, basically animals. Um, because animals have already converted non-heme iron into heme iron for themselves, um, if you eat them, then you will get heme iron already made for you. Um, there are the plant sources or the animal product sources like eggs, milk, whole grains, enriched cereals, green vegetables especially, um, and then dried fruit. Those have non-heme iron sources in them. So you can absorb the iron from those other sources. It's just more complicated um, and you don't necessarily get all of it that you need. So people who don't eat um, meat have to make sure they have enough uh, heme iron or at least bioavailability when they put the iron in and that's going to play a role in like which foods you eat with other foods you don't want to eat the same meal over and over and over because then you know you're going to be potentially blocking your iron absorption um, it does say that iron is one of the most difficult mineral to obtain in adequate amounts in the American diet. We find that a lot of, uh, a lot of people are, um, they are anemic, um, which means that they don't have enough iron, which we'll get there, but um, uh, mostly it is, it's women. So as far as toxicity goes, if you were to get too much of this, um, you would have hemochromatosis, um, which leads to organ damage. You can get coronary heart disease is going to play a role in having too much iron. Uh, skin pigmentation would change and then cirrhosis of the liver because your liver does a lot of the uh, storage and kind of um, um, synthesis of, of iron. The body does not easily eliminate excess iron, right? Because it has that transfer and running around, picking it all back up again. Um, and so that can explain why iron absorption rates are poor because we don't really get rid of it. If we get enough, often enough, then we typically don't run low. But if we're getting too much, then that's not good for us. Again, you probably see that more in like supplementation than you do uh, in just like a traditional diet. As far as the deficiency goes, um, this one is, is way more common. Um, in early stages, it is the microcytic anemia. Um, it can show up in uh, dental hygiene um, text as the angular chelosis. Uh, we also see it in the pallor of lips and gingiva. So if you see someone who uh, probably shouldn't have pale gingiva, but it just looks a little too, uh, too pale, then it could be this. Uh, they can develop a sore burning tongue through you know, glossitis, although uh, we learned in the last chapter that you know glossitis can be caused by a lot of things. Um, atrophy of the filiform papilla, which that's what causes glossitis. Um, there is a risk of candidiasis and there is a possible increased carry susceptibility. Moving on to the physiologic role of zinc in the diet. 
uh, its component in more than 300 enzymes that affect cell growth and replication of DNA and RNA synthesis. And I know we've talked about it a lot, like when we talked about calcium and we talked about, um, you know, all, all different, different times throughout, it's been like, well, zinc plays a role in this absorption. So now we're finally back around to zinc. Um, it plays a role in our collagen synthesis, bone resorption and remodeling. It plays a role in sexual maturation through puberty, right? Uh, night vision, immune defenses, and it also is gonna play a role in our taste, smell, and appetite. So zinc might be well recognized as the most important essential trace mineral for humans. The requirements, the recommended uh, dietary allowance is going to be 11 milligrams a day for men and eight milligrams a day for women. The upper or the tolerable upper intake level is going to be 40 milligrams a day for adults. Um, as far as absorption and excretion, the bioavailability of zinc is very wide. It depends on the other types of food you have and, and how much of it that you need. Appropriately, 25 to 40 percent of the dietary zinc is absorbed. Uh, so you might remember way back in some of the first chapters, we talked about a primary deficiency and a secondary deficiency. So a primary one is when the nutrient is absent from the diet, and a secondary deficiency is when uh, the nutrient is available in the diet, but for whatever reason your body isn't absorbing it that's what happens with zinc so if you are uh, low typically it's because something's going on with you that you aren't absorbing it correctly and it could very well just be that you're eating whatever source of zinc it is um, with something that blocks the absorption of it um, and then zinc is going to be lost in feces Okay, so sources of zinc are going to be lamb, beef, crustaceans, uh, especially oysters, eggs, and peanuts. So you can see that someone who wouldn't eat animal products is going to have to eat peanuts. Hopefully they're not allergic. Um, as far as hyper states of zinc goes, um, if you have too much, you can run into vomiting and diarrhea, epigastric pain probably from the vomiting and diarrhea. Um, lethargy and fatigue, those are the same thing. Renal damage, pancreatitis, and of course death. Um, if you have excesses of zinc, it can reduce your copper status. Remember when we talked about copper and how zinc plays a role in copper's absorption? Well, copper plays a role in zinc's absorption. Um, it's going to alter iron function and it is going to decrease immune function, which will make you more prone to getting sick. Um, it's going to decrease high density lipoproteins as well, which that would be bad because we want more high density lipoproteins. That's that HDL cholesterols. All right, and then hypo states of zinc or not enough will be thickening of the epithelium, the impaired keratinization of epithelial cells, increased susceptibility to periodontal disease. You have a connective tissue issue and then flattened filiform papilla, loss of taste and smell acuity, poor appetite, and impaired wound healing. Okay, and then last, uh, but certainly not least, is iodine. Iodine plays a huge role. Um, the physiologic roles is going to be in the production of thyroxine. Thyroxine is very important. Uh, thyroxine will regulate the basal metabolic rate. So when we see patients who have a hypothyroidism, that means that their basal metabolic rate is not being regulated at, uh, at where it should be. Thyroid hormones are essential for normal brain development. Uh, so the thyroid is, is uh, ridiculously important. Um, and iodine plays a role in keeping our thyroid healthy. Um, the requirements for the, the recommended dietary allowance is going to be 150 uh, micrograms a day. Tolerable upper intake level is 1,100 micrograms a day. Currently, iodine intake of the average American is adequate, and that's because they added it to our salt, our table salt, 
uh, typically has that added iodine. Iodine levels for pregnant and breastfeeding women are less than desirable. So uh, whenever you become pregnant or breastfeeding, you should consume slightly more iodine, which we'll talk about when we get to the pregnancy chapter. Sources of iodine are going to be in seafood, in plants grown near the ocean, um, like uh, algae, and then molasses, yogurt, milk, and iodized salt. The iodine content of meat and animal products depends on iodine content of foods consumed by the animals. So if the animals were given iodine supplementation, then they'll probably be somewhat good sources of that. Uh, but if not, then they, then they won't. Um, and then iodine isn't in all table salt, so you kind of do want to be careful. Um, I thought I had it in my salt, and then I looked recently and found out um, it, has a, it has a big thing on the label that says this salt doesn't have iodine in it. So um, I, I had to go get some. Um, iodide in salt will remain stable for many months as long as it's kept dry, preferably in a cool place away from the light because uh, the UV ray from sunlight will degrade the iodine. As far as hyper and hypo, so in hyper states, excessive amounts of um, iodine is going to result in thyroiditis hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, and sensitivity reactions. Basically, if you have too much iodine, your thyroid is going to react to it in some sort of way. It's going to become inflamed, you're going to have inflammation there, and either it's going to boost or it's going to completely stop. Um, in hypo states where you do not have enough iodine, the biggest one you need to remember, you'll, you may very well see it on your boards, is going to be goiter. So that is the enlargement of the thyroid gland. If you look in your book on page 229, you'll see an image of a woman who has goiter. Um, I always think of the Tangled movie where the guy is singing the song about um, what he wants and he he has a goiter, um, it's a, but he's pretty funny about it. And then spontaneous abortions and congenital abnormal uh, anomalies um, is can happen if you don't have enough iodine. It can delay eruption of primary and secondary teeth in children. Um, it can um, enlarge the size of the tongue. And then an endemic cretinism, which I'm sure you guys are going to learn about in special needs as well, but those can all be affected by uh, low amounts of iodine. The, um, oh, in figure 12.11, that's the picture that I, I needed to tell you to look at. Okay, so that is the end of this chapter and the end of this week module uh, lessons. If you have questions, please uh, reach out to me or you know stop me in clinic, uh, whatever it takes.